Okay, well, thanks very much. So um, I'm going to, this was supposed to be a general interest talk on strange metals and black holes. And uh, let me begin by uh, defining the what a strange metal is. Uh, so this is part, you know, and there have been a number of recent observations of what people are calling Planckian transport. Uh, but Planckian transport, uh, one means what's shown here that you, you, you have some metal uh, where you have some estimate of the effective mass of the carriers and the density of the carriers, and you measure the resistivity. And then you use the standard Drude formula to convert the resistivity to a scattering time tau. And what people have found in a number of correlated electron systems um, that one over tau is numerically very close over a wide temperature regime uh, to this universal Planckian rate because it depends only on the temperature and Planck's constant. So I'll show you some of the data in the cube rates and magic angle graphene, uh, but there are also similar data on the nictides and also in ultra cold atoms, but at somewhat higher temperatures. Now, now it's, in fact, it's possible to get many, many systems in which the resistance varies linearly with temperature at moderately high temperature. Uh, but the strange metal problem, as I'll define it, is really trying to understand whether you can have uh, this resistivity behaving linear in temperature down to essentially zero temperature or some very low temperature, much below all the natural energy scales, which could be the Debye frequency, the, uh, the Fermi energy, or some interaction strength. Uh, and it's quite remarkable that there's so many systems in which this one over tau, which normally you would think depends on the some kind of electron-electron interaction strength, seems to be entirely independent of it. So quickly, I'll just show you some of the data. This is the data and uh, the most latest material, uh, twisted bilayer graphene, uh, which uh, you know has the superconducting phases uh, spanning a correlated insulator. So this is at nu equals minus two. Uh, and if you look at higher temperatures here, uh, especially on the holdup sides, you see a regime of uh, resistivity that varies linearly with temperature. Um, here's another recent paper by the group of Louis Taifair. This is on a whole bunch of materials, uh, most of which are the high temperature superconductors, both electron and hole doped, and also an organic superconductor here, uh, where the electron density and the effective mass have rather large variations. Uh, but if you convert by the Drude formula, and you write one over tau as kT over h bar, uh, first of all, it is indeed linearly proportional temperature, and the curve number alpha you can see is, you know, uh, varies between 0.7 and and 1.2 over a wide range of materials. Okay, so there's really no complete understanding of this, and and one of the you know, and that is what I define as the strange metal puzzle or problem. Okay, so what I'm going to do in this talk is. First talk about a, a, a very simple model, uh, which ex exhibits certain uh, type of criticality that I'll call SYK criticality. I'll define what I mean by it, uh, which has some features that look like strange metals and also that look like black holes. Uh, and then in the remaining two parts of my talk, uh, in part two, I'll talk about a more realistic model, but still quite removed from the real situation, but closer to it. Uh, where at least we can find in this model uh, indication of a strange metal down to zero temperature. Uh, and then hopefully I'll have time, some time to also talk about the connection to black holes. All right, so let's start with SYK criticality. So here's a very quick pictorial representation of what is the SYK model. Uh, you imagine you have some set of positions or orbitals which have some electronic states that an electron can occupy. These could be in real space, they could be in orbital space, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and then you occupy some fraction of them. Uh, so I'm not going to write down the spins of the electrons, although they could also carry spin. And then you now allow these electrons, these fermions, as we call them, uh, to move. And, and the basic rule of the model is that they're allowed to move 
anywhere, but only in pairs. So you pick, uh, you know, let's see, those two electrons can move to these sites and they go ahead and do it. Uh, so any one of these processes is a term in the Hamiltonian uh, and the amplitude for any of this process uh, is a random number. So that's basically the model where you disallow a single particle hopping. If you had single particle hopping, you just essentially get what's called a random matrix model, which describes you know, certain quantum dots quite well. But now you're imagining a you know, regime for that for some reason this single particle hopping is weak, but you have uh, lots of random uh, interactions between electrons. Okay. So here's a Hamiltonian if you want to see it. So it, alpha, beta, gamma, delta are labeled these n orbitals. Uh, U alpha, beta, gamma, delta is just a random number with zero mean and mean square amplitude u. Uh, and then you have a chemical potential that you can vary. Um, and uh, Q is the, is the charge density, which varies between zero and one in this model. Okay, so that's the model. And indeed it can be solved exactly in the limit of N goes to infinity. Uh, it reduces to some set of equations you can solve quickly on a computer. Uh, and in the last few years, you know, a great deal has been learned of the structure uh, of the one over n expansions and even some statements to all orders in uh, one over n. So I won't go through the how all that's been done. I'll just tell you what what is what is the ground state and the low temperature properties of this model look like. So the key properties are first of all, in some fundamental sense, the this model realizes a quantum critical state, which I, I'll describe more precisely why. Uh, and furthermore, there are no quasi-particle excitations. That, you, that means you can't think of the low-lying states as just uh, sums or differences of various quasi-particles. And this quantum critical state is present for a range of densities around Q equals a half. So meaning uh, as you vary mu, you can get, provided you're not too far from half-filling, you're pretty much in the same state. So it's really like a, a phase, really, of variable density. And uh, first of all, it's rare to have a exactly solvable model without quasi-particles. And it's even rarer to find something that's compressible, meaning you can change the density there continuously. So that's one of the reasons we've been very interested in this space. Um, so if you look at the Green's function, that the, this is the single electron Green's function on a single site, which actually self-averages, um, that has this universal form, which in fact, implies a certain SL2R symmetry uh, at low temperatures. Uh, and, uh, and it has this exponent one half, which is one indication that it's, um, there are no quasi-particle excitations because in a Fermi liquid or a disordered Fermi liquid, that exponent would be one. Um, okay. The another, initially, another remarkable property of this model is that there is uh, the entropy density doesn't vanish as temperature goes to zero. So here the order of limits is crucial. You take the entropy of the system for a given n and t. You look at the entropy per particle. You first send to in, n to infinity and then temperature to zero. And this is a non-zero number. Uh, now, if you did it the other way around and you got a non-zero number, that would imply a ground state degeneracy. And, so, you know, and only very special models have exponentially large ground state degeneracy. Any perturbation would lift that. But this is much more robust. It's only lifted by one perturbation, not any perturbation. And that one perturbation is the single particle hopping. Uh, and it's not due to ground state degeneracy. In fact, what it means, what it, all it says is that if you look at the energy level spacing uh, between two successive many body states, the spacing is exponentially small. Now by itself, that's not a surprise. Any system, any many body system has um, uh, states that have an exponentially small separation when you're in the middle of the spectrum. Uh, what's remarkable here is that this, the same spacing applies down all the way down to the ground state. Uh, okay. Uh, another very interesting feature, which is partly anticipated by this form here, uh, is that the natural time scale for that dynamics and thermal equilibration 
uh, is just h bar over kt, so this Planckian type. Uh, more recently, um, people working in quantum gravity, especially have focused attention on what they call the out of time order correlator. Um, and this correlator measures the growth of quantum chaos. Uh, and they define this exponent lambda, which is this quantum Lyapunov exponent. Uh, and this model has a property that it saturates the largest possible value that's allowed by um, just some uh, Semi rigorous quantum mechanical arguments. Okay. Um, and finally, if these electrons, uh, if these fermions were spinful, then you can define a spin correlation function, a uh, local spin correlation function. And one consequence of this one over square root of tau decay um, of the elect single electron Green's function is that this would decay as one over tau. Uh, whereas in a disordered Fermi liquid state, it decays one over tau squared. Okay, so these uh, six properties I've defined is what I call SYK criticality. Uh, these are properties that can be rigorously established, sorry, <laughs> rigorously established for the uh, um, uh, SYK model, but we believe that uh, these properties will also be present for a much larger class of physical systems. But of course, establishing that uh, is then much harder. Uh, okay, so as I said, so what I'm going to do in the rest of my talk is talk about some other systems, which in fact share uh, these same properties. So next I'll talk about a metal insulated transition and a random Hubbard model. Uh, which will be at half filling then, because you have a met, both an insulating phase and a metal phase. Uh, and, but I'll also mention some recent work on metal to metal transitions in a random TJ model, which uh, could be possibly related to phenomena in the cube rates. And hopefully I'll just mention a few words about how all of these properties are also shared by extremal charged black holes uh, at low temperatures. Okay. Uh, but before I get to those systems, uh, let's try to build a strange metal out of just the SYK model. Uh, there's been a great deal of work on that and the general strategy is to take the, these SYK models, put them in an island and make a lattice of them. So now in addition to the interaction within each island, which now you can think of as a multi-orbital atom, uh, there's a hopping T between the orbitals. Um, and there's Many details can be different uh, in all of the works, but there's some universal property. What you find, first of all, is that there indeed is a wide regime where you get all of these SYK criticality properties I showed you earlier. And, and, but it's not down to zero temperature, it's between temperatures smaller than the interaction strength, but bigger than T squared over U, where T and U are the parameters shown here. Uh, so you get all of the SYK critical properties and also you get a resistance going linearly with temperature. Uh, and you know, this is a, the coefficient here depends sensitively on all kinds of quantum critical dynamics. It's not just a classical Bose factor. Uh, and it's really a, quite a non-trivial result that this works out. Uh, but it's for this somewhat artificial model. Uh, so, uh, but there are also, so, you know, it's, it still be hesitant to apply this to something like the cube rates because there's some shortcomings. The linear resistivity is only for uh, above some temperature scale. This can be present in any electron density, whereas in most materials, you know, there's some critical density below which you don't get this behavior and you get a pseudo gap phase and eventually an insulator. Uh, and that's totally missing from this kind of uh, lattice uh, SYK model. It's just a metal at any density, non-Fermi liquid metal of this type. All right, so now I go to part two. As I see, I won't have time for part three really, uh, where I'm gonna talk about a somewhat more realistic model. So here's the model. Uh, now I have uh, electrons which can hop between sides i and j with uh, hopping tij, which is a random number, uh, n sites, they also have spin. Then there's an exchange interaction, uh, jij between pairs of electrons, uh, which is uh, uh, also random. 
just a, and then finally, there's a, a repulsion between electrons at the same site, uh, which is going to be always positive and non-random. So this is the Hubbard U. That's why I, that's the H there to remind you. It's the non-random Hubbard interaction. So let me now just we're going to scan quickly the phase diagram of this model, what we know about it uh, as a function of one over U uh, and doping. So when U is very large and the doping is zero, uh, well, then you just get one electron per site uh, and the model becomes essentially just a pure uh, exchange model. So this is like a quantum generalization, spin a half of what's sometimes called the SK model, the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model uh, of a spin glass. And, in, and it's known now that indeed uh, that this model in fact does have spin glass order, even when you put the quantum mechanics in uh, from, from numerical work. Okay, so what we want to do is now to reduce the value of U. And eventually when U is very small, uh, because you have lots of hopping, you just get a disordered Fermi liquid state. And I want to now uh, show you some, some beautiful results that were obtained by uh, the group of Cha et al. Uh, numerically, where they studied this model in, in the limit of large n. And so that requires quite a uh, demanding numerical work. Uh, and, and they found a continuous phase transition then between what's presumably a spin glass state to a metal. Uh, and moreover, their results show that at this point, and only at this point, down to zero temperature, uh, the SYK criticality that is defined in the first part of my talk is realized. Uh, so in particular, this is their spin correlation function, uh, which decays as this one over tau. Uh, they get this linear resistivity, in fact, uh, in a model where you generalize it in a way you can define resistivity by going to some large dimension limit. And it looks very much like it's going linearly with temperature all the way down to zero temperature. Um, and there is also some analytical understanding uh, of why they're getting these remarkable properties uh, in, in a very recent paper uh, by our group. And there we, of course, we have to take another limit to understand it because the problem is really too difficult to solve on its own. Uh, but it's entirely consistent with this model, uh, at least at this critical point, uh, realizes uh, the criticality varies with all the properties I mentioned, including the maximal Lyapunov exponent and uh, the Planckian uh, dissipation and the non-zero zero temperature entropy will all be features of this critical point between the, the sort of Fermi liquid and the spin glass. Um, now we can start to dope the system. So if you dope the system at very large U, uh, then you're going to do that by just and essentially sending u to infinity. Uh, then you'll only have three possible states at each site, and that'll be done by what you call the TJ model. Uh, so this has not been studied numerically yet, although some other work is underway. Uh, but we have our recent paper uh, of Joshi et al, where we have some, uh, some arguments as to what, what happens. So the argument that the spin glass phase that's found at half filling gets extended to non-zero doping. And then eventually there's a quantum critical point to a metallic state at some critical PC. And all along this line, you again have SYK criticality. Uh, although I should mention that the, the theory, the details of the theory along this line are quite different from the theory at that point. Here there's particle hole asymmetry, there's particle hole symmetry only at that point. Um, okay, so let's see how I'm doing on time. So I was going to say a little bit more about how we come up with the theory of this point. Let me just say very quickly. So the way this works, yeah, so let me just summarize the phase diagram actually. I won't give you the details of how it's obtained. So what we find as a critical P, P equals PC, uh, which is, you know, we're going across here. Um, there is a critical point and at that critical point, these three states that you have uh, in the TJ model are nearly degenerate to leading order in, in the loop expansion that we do. Uh, and furthermore, the spin correlation decay exactly as one over tau, which is something we can show to all orders uh, in our expansion parameter. 
Um, but there's also a cute result that follows from the near degeneracy of these states. Uh, it means that the density of holes at this point is one third, because one of three states is empty. Um, and uh, you know that's not so far from the experimental critical point decuperates. So so that's uh, uh, so, you know quite encouraging. Now, when you move away from the critical point, let's go to higher doping. At higher doping, you expect they will do more holes, so you'd expect the whole state to have lower energy. Uh, and on lower doping, you'd expect the spinful states to have lower energy. And so you can crudely understand what goes on by just imagining, by, by doing a, like a slave boson representation, you think of the whole as a boson here, uh, which, which that condenses, uh, and then you're the actual fermionic carriers carry spin. So you just effectively, once this boson has condensed, uh, you just get a Fermi liquid. Um, and this uh, boson is the empty state or sometimes called the holon. Now you may know that when you write a TJ model in terms of bosons and fermions, there's a, there's a choice. This particular representation is sometimes called Schwinger fermions because the spins are represented by fermions. Uh, you can do it the other way. You can also have Schwinger bosons. Uh, and that's what you want to do here because you want to make the lower energy state a boson so then you can condense it and take advantage of by putting many particles in that low energy state. So when you do that here, then the carriers have density P, whereas here they had, there are many fewer of them. Uh, whereas here, you know, uh, you have density of fermions, one minus P or holes one plus P. Um, but because you've here on this side, you've condensed the bosons and they carry spin, you get spin glass order. So that's entirely consistent then uh, with this phase diagram here, where you've got spin glass order this side, a disordered Fermi liquid, smoothly connected to the Fermi liquid here. So all of that fits in that, minim in that minimal phase diagram. And you also get for free then SYK criticality at this critical point and also a change in the carrier density. And very quickly, I won't go into details, many of these features are at least qualitatively consistent with many recent experiments, including deep in specific heat, uh, the change in the uh, Hall coefficient as you go across this critical PC, uh, and very recently, a detailed observation of spin glass order of below PC uh, at high fields by nuclear magnetic resonance. Okay. All right. So I have about six minutes to teach you about black holes. All right. So, so let me do that and show you at least summarize why is it that black holes also realize besides all the features, six features of SYK criticality that are highlighted in the first part. So a black hole um, is a region of dense matter, which is uh, causally disconnected from the rest of the universe uh, in at least classical gravity. And this is the radius of the horizon for, uh, given in terms of the mass of the black hole. Uh, but quantum mechanically, there is some connection between the inside and outside of a black hole, uh, because you can imagine an EPR pair gets separated with one side inside and the other pair outside the black hole. And then if you're outside the black hole, since you have no access or information of what the qubit inside is doing, uh, it's as if the, the qubit in your hands outside the black hole um, is, is random. And that's very crudely is how you understand the fact that uh, the black hole has a, a, a temperature and an entropy. And furthermore, the entropy is proportional to the surface area of the black hole. Okay, uh, because it's, the entanglement is happening right only on the surface, near the surface of the black hole. So these are two key properties of black hole. They have an entropy and a temperature and the entropy for the surface area. Uh, but another somewhat less well-known property of black holes is that they also have Planckian time dynamics. And by here, I'm you know, thinking, imagine you have a black hole that's a non-equilibrium state, like this merger uh, observed by LIGO. And just before the, <coughs> the black holes totally merge, they're in this, uh, this awkward shape, and eventually they relax down to a perfect sphere and classically, that sphere is at zero temperature and remain a sphere forever. Uh, quantum mechanically, of course, it's radiating a little bit. 
um, and also have a temperature and entropy. Uh, but if I look at this relaxation time, uh, the very last bit of the, uh, uh, what you call the ring down time, from Einstein's equations, that's eight pi gm over c cubed. Uh, it's a purely classical effect. But if you think of this as some system coming to thermal equilibrium, uh, which is what quantum mechanics would say is happening, and then ask what is the time it takes in terms of the temperature, the quantum mechanical temperature, which is T Hawking, you find that this number is essentially equal to this. Uh, so there's an H bar here, but there's an H bar and T Hawking and they cancel out. But if you think in terms of the Hawking temperature, the ring down time is again, this Planckian time. Uh, and this is true for many different categories of black hole. So this is the third important property of a black hole that it has this Planckian time. So this gives me uh, this way to introduce the idea of holography, um, which is that we want to think about, realize these quantum properties by a quantum system without gravity. Uh, can any quantum system share all of these properties? Well, first of all, for it to get the entropy proportional surface area, that quantum system must look like, a, must have one lower dimension. So it's, and that's the word holography. This, this is a quantum system, roughly speaking, is sitting on the surface of the black hole. It's equivalent to it. Uh, and you want to get this Planckian time equilibration, and that immediately tells you it has to be a strongly interacting system without quasi-particle excitations, uh, which is what, an SY, like an SYK model or some strongly interacting conformal field theory, which is the way it was in, uh, in original discovery of holography using uh, string theory. Okay, so now I want to look at a very specific type of black hole where there's a further simplification. And this is a black hole that has a net charge in purely Einstein-Maxwell theory. Uh, so what happens to these black holes is that if you go very near the horizon, uh, this angular direction X essentially decouples in the equations of motion. And the low energy equations are just, depend on one spatial coordinate, which I call zeta and time. This is just a property of the classical Einstein equation. So we address the limited problem of quantizing this one plus one dimensional black hole, which is found on the surface of any charged black hole at low temperatures. Well, if I apply the idea of holography, uh, then, then it must be the case that uh, the dual system, the quantum mechanical system without gravity uh, describing uh, the quantization of two-dimensional gravity near the surface of a charged black hole uh, must be in zero space dimensions. Uh, and it turns out uh, that's, that's exactly what the SYK model provides. It provides a concrete realization of a quantum system in zero space dimensions whose low energy equations and low energy properties completely match those you obtain by quantizing the low energy theory of a charged black hole. Okay, um, yeah. so I think I'm almost done. I'm doing okay on time. I'll turn my phone off. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, pretty much the basic result. Here's a few more equations if you want to see them. Um, so what happens near the horizon of a charged black hole when you solve Einstein's equation is that the metric factorizes uh, and the radial metric in terms of zeta and t is this anti de Sitter space. Uh, and there's also a, a electric field on the surface of a black hole, uh, which goes as one over, the vector potential goes as one over zeta. Um, and and so that's the very low temperature behavior. If you look at a slightly higher temperature, uh, you will have to worry about the corrections to this very low temperature behavior. Uh, and those are roughly given by the fluctuations, the boundary between this region where you have this factorization into two-dimensional gravity to a far region where you just have four-dimensional gravity, say. Uh, and the fluctuations of the boundary are described by a certain theory called the Schwarzschild theory. And this Schwarzschild theory also appears in the SYK model. So it's not just the very low temperature properties right near the horizon, but also the properties crossing over to somewhat higher energies, uh, which are also coincide with those of the SYK model. So this has been established by a whole bunch of papers 
something I wrote in 2010, I only talked about the very low temperature properties without the Schwarzschild. And then Kitev uh, and Maldasen and Stanford introduced uh, remarkably showed that uh, that this actually applied uh, to to a greater degree of accuracy than than I had realized or even imagined. <laughs> so here's the the summary of the precise statement: If you take an SYK model of strength U at temperatures much smaller than U, and or charged black holes in Einstein uh, Maxwell gravity. Uh, at temperatures much smaller than the inverse horizon radius, the quantum fluctuation of both of these systems are all described by precisely the same Schwarzschild theory here. And you, the remarkable fact is you can derive this action starting either from Einstein's equations or from the SYK model. Okay, so that's really all I have to say. So, uh, so I introduced the idea of SYK criticality uh, has the property of uh, no quasi-particle excitation, Planckian time dissipation, non-zero temperature entropy, maximum quantum layoff of exponent, and spin correlation decaying as one over tau. Uh, and this is realized at the metal insulator transition and the metal-metal transition uh, the, of the infinite range uh, TJU model, uh, and also uh, connects up to the quantum fluctuations of charged black holes. Okay, thank you.